Hey folks, welcome to this week's video where we are looking at the historical context behind the film Red Cliff. Okay, so before we get into this, I do want to say I want you to challenge your expectations of what you think um, looks good in movies because when you start watching this film, you may notice that the format and the way that they present the story is a little different compared to what you might be a little more familiar with in, in Hollywood films. This film was produced in China by a lot of different Asian actors producers and the director as well and so the way that they frame this very important event in Chinese imperial history might be a little different compared to what you're used to back here back home so as we watch the movie you may start to think there's some themes here that make it feel like hey I'm kind of watching a movie trailer or I'm watching like a kung fu movie or I'm watching a, a fast-paced movie that doesn't have that slow buildup that we might find in a lot of American uh, movies, okay? This film is going to drop us right into the heart of a very important moment in Chinese history. And I just want you to th change your expectations. Not to say that this is not a good movie. That's not what I'm saying. But that you change your expectations to where you're more open to how they present the story. So you can see that it's a great film. Because this was a massive hit in China when it was first released in 2008. Now, as we get into the story, we are going to back up a little bit. We're going to get up to 208 BC. As you can see from our timeline of Chinese dynasties, you can see that we're in the Han Dynasty, but we're getting very close to the end of the actual story itself, of the actual Han Dynasty. And this is going to be the prelude to the Warring States period where frankly there's going to be a lot of different uh, different states controlled by various warlords that are going to fight each other in order to try to gain influence throughout all of China. At this point in time, the Han Dynasty is weakened. There's not as much uh, going on in terms of their stability, although during this dynasty we will get some of the greatest cultural achievements um, and cultural identity for a lot of different Chinese as the timeline progresses on this picture. Now, Red Cliffs, or Red Cliff, I should say, is marked by this inscription outside of Chibi City in China. It is the most likely spot that we believe the, re the actual battle happened, but this is going to be a battle fought with naval forces and also with ground forces. And it's going to be what some people have said uh, what some people have said is it's going to be the largest naval battle ever fought um, based on how many people are actually there. That is up for debate, but we do know that it was a very important battle because the people that it fought between that that fought in the battle shaped the actual power dynamics of China af uh, well after the battle as well. As you can see from the map down here, at this point in time, the Han Dynasty, the Han Emperor, they uh, relied on warlords in various provinces to basically control different parts of the empire because I mean, this is a, this is an empire stretching hundreds of miles with um, at hundreds of thousands of people if not millions of people at this point in time and so you'll notice that Chow Chow here in the middle is next to the capital he serves the emperor then you have Wan Shou, Zhang Lu these two warlords are going to be defeated by Chow Chow prior to Chow Chow trying to go south to take over Lu Zhong Lu Bao, Yan Shu, or even Sun Si. Okay. Now, in this historical setting, the Chinese emperor, I need to correct this, he's not the last emperor of the Han Dynasty, but we're getting very, very close to the end of the Han Dynasty. Um, he finds himself in a weakened position. His warlords are starting to notice that he doesn't have as much of a grip on power. He's not as confident as he should be. And they realize that, hey, if he can be manipulated by someone like Chow Chow, then this is bad and we should protest. And frankly, in their eyes, they start to protest and actually raise armies and, and try to move against Chow Chow and other imperial forces as a way of preserving the Han Emperor in the Han throne. Other warlords are just like, nah, I just want I just want the throne for myself or I want more influence. So I'm just gonna do what I I'm gonna do me, you do you, I'm not gonna follow you anymore. And so nobles who are in very are in charge of various commanderies or provinces or forts, if you want to call them that, um, throughout the entire uh, entirety of Han China, 
they notice that there's this vacuum, and they're going to use the various armies to jockey among themselves to be the most powerful. Chao Chao is an effective military commander. He's the greatest warlord serving the emperor, or at least he claims to do so. However, he's also power-hungry, ambitious. He's willing to do anything he needs to do in order to try to achieve victory in battle. He is ruthless. And so after he defeats the warlords in the north, defeats uh, foreign invaders in the north as well, and in the west, he then turns his attention to the south to try to bring the rival warlords of Lu Bei, Sun Quan, and Lu Bao under the control of the emperor. So as he starts to march south, he will eventually take out Lu Bao. So in, in the movie, you actually don't even hear the name Lu Bao. In 2000, or sorry, 200, 208 BCE, um, you're going to see that Chao's going to head south. He has, we know at least several hundred thousand men. Some of the troops are impressed into the military, meaning the, as he's taken over other warlords, he also assumes their army. Um, so some of the soldiers he commands are actually very loyal to him, but they kind of have to do it because if not, they get their head chopped off. He claims that he has 800,000 men in preparation for this battle. Lu Bei, who is a warlord who has been def pretty much defeated by Chao ahead of this time, decides that, hey, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And although I don't like some of the other warlords, I'm going to go to Sun Quan and basically say, Look, you and I may not always get along, but at least we have a common enemy in Chao Chao. Would you like to be friends and join our forces in order to defeat him or to try to defeat him, even if he vastly outnumbers us? And so Sun Quan, seeing that this is an opportunity where he would need more, as many people as he could, he could possibly get to try to defeat I mean, an army that was at least several hundred thousand uh, men, he's like, yeah, let's do it, bro. So they combine forces, they number uh, around 50,000. Chao's going to arrive to the Southlands, the province that Sun Quan leads, with an army on condition to the environment. The soldiers are going to have uh, outbreaks of malaria, other forms of diseases. And they're also going to have a lot of low morale because they've been marching across China like for several months, if not years, prior to this battle, and they're just tired. They ready, they want to go home and spend some time with their families. Zhao Yun, who is Sun Quan's top general, and Zhu Ge Liang, who you're going to hear named uh, Kong Ming most of the time in the movie, he is Lu Bei's top strategist. These two, Zhu Yun and Zhu Ge Liang, um, devise a plan that they think, okay, if Chao Chao has the biggest advantage in, ha in his ships, and they're all stationed together, and they're actually attached to each other using a system of like, um, not sticks, but they have. There's a system where they're all connected to try to m make sure that the ships stay smooth and don't rock too much because the troops aren't conditioned to being on the on the sea. They say, "What if we take burning ships and ram them into the fleet? And if the wind is on our side, it'll actually help spread the flames to the rest of the fleet." Chao Chao will be weakened because we won't have any naval ships to retreat with or even to fight with. And then we can then take our ground forces and attack the camp of Chao Chao. And if we are lucky enough, we can surprise him, overtake his forces, cause them to retreat, surrender, and that will achieve military victory. They will be successful in this endeavor. Chao Chao will eventually retreat after losing the battle due to heavy losses. He will station a few people in different parts of China that he's conquered from the other warlords. But frankly, at this point in time, Chao Chao is defeated and never again will there be a, a, an important moment such as this in which northern China will try to defeat southern China outside of the Warring States period. All right. Now, as we get into the characters, these are the people that you need to know. I'm going to give you the brief details about each because there's it might seem like there's a lot of different characters when you first get started. Emperor Xi'an of the Han Dynasty, he is in a weakened position. He is going to be heavily influenced by Chao Chao. He is going to name Chao Chao Prime Minister or Chancellor of the entire empire with basically the freedom to do whatever he wants because Chao Chao has that much of an influence on him and can basically manipulate him like a puppet. As we move forward, Chao Chao is going to be the Chancellor of China during the end, uh, near the end of the Han Dynasty. He's been commissioned, or basically gave himself the commission of, hey, I'm going to go defeat these other warlords, and I'm going to use any tactics, any means necessary to be able to defeat them. 
He is very effective throughout most of his campaign. Although he is power hungry and ambitious, he is good at what he does, and his troops are able to exact um, terrible influence throughout all of China. His enemies fear him, and he knows that, and he tries to use that to his advantage. However, because he accomplishes this string of victories, he then becomes kind of arrogant and makes very bad decisions at the Battle of Red Cliffs by believing that his army could simply... Uh, since it was numerically superior to that of Sun Quan and Lu Bei's forces, that they could just go head to head. And because he has so many men to get rid of or dispose of or collateral, he would easily defeat them. He was wrong, and in his arrogance, Lu Bei and Zhao Yun were able to, um, along with Sun Quan, were able to defeat him decisively at the Battle of Red Cliffs. Um, when it comes to what happened next, he would retreat after. The uh, moving across, moving north of the Yangtze River, which is one of the major waterways in China. Liu Bei is the one of the rival warlords that Cha Chao is trying to defeat. He's weakened by this point in time because he's been he's been fighting not only Cha Chao but he's been fighting Sun Quan, who he's eventually going to be friends with in real life. In the movie, you don't see that. So when they start, when he sends an emissary, he sends Zhu Ge Liang over to Sun Quan and to say, "Hey, we should be friends." Lu Bei is kind of ignoring the fact that, hey, we've been enemies for a long time. Sun Quan will see that, yeah, this is this is an important alliance. I need this. They're going to be friends. They're going to join forces and then try to effectively take over Chao Chao or defeat him. In the movie, you're also going to see Lu Bei rely on three generals who are exceptionally skilled in combat. Now, when you start watching them, you're going to be like, okay, um, I don't necessarily believe some of this stuff that you that I'm seeing, but I'll get into that in a second. Kong Ming, or Zhu Ge Liang, is the chief military strategist for Liu Bei. He is very knowledgeable when it comes to impending weather for, uh, forecasts, and he uses that to his advantage in predicting what's going to happen during a battle. So he's able to say, oh, I, I noticed that there's going to be um, a wind blowing from the southeast, which is not usual for this time of year, but that'll trick Chao Chao into thinking that the fire that we use to burn his ships will actually f- fly back in our faces and burn our fleet. He starts to notice when that when that wind changes to southeast, that fire is going to move in the opposite direction and basically destroy the fi- the fleet of Chao Chao. He's going to be very important to try to also retrieve a hundred thousand arrows from Chao Chao by using a bunch of fake ships with grass on them and under the cover of fog, he's going to uh, tempt the naval fleet to, to just fire arrow after arrow into these ships which they'll then use the arrows to actually help supply their war effort. Zhang Fei, Zhu Yun, and Guan Yu are actually uh, Lu Bei's three top generals. They are ex- uh, exceptionally skilled in what they, whatever form of combat they choose, and they are very great at marshalling the forces of Lu Bei to be able to lead the final charges from the ground against Chao Chao's camp. Now, Zhang Fei up here... He's very bold, assertive. He isn't afraid to duke it out with his fists. The reason why I say it's not so easy to believe how he's fighting is he is able to, if he runs, he said because he's big enough, if he runs fast enough and throws his arms up, he can effectively knock over a man on a horse. And if you've ever been around a horse, you know that it would be extremely hard and require a lot of force for even one person to be able to knock over a horse. Now, over here, you have Zhao Yun, who is, I would say, the top general you'll see the most throughout the film. But he is Liu Bei's, like, prize swordsman. He's very great. Oh, sorry. Spearman. He's very great at using spears to exact terrible damage upon the enemy. He is also going to be uh, in the final scene helping Zhao Yun to go, re- to go rescue his wife from the evil clutches of Chao Chao. Down here, Guan Yu, who you will see the least amount in the film, is an excellent swordsman, and he he is able to quickly stop any enemies from even being able to try to stab him with just one flick of the sword, or one flick of the wrist, if you want to bring up that song. Um, and so, although they're great at doing what they do, they're known as great men, and they're able to kill a whole bunch of people without ever getting a scratch. It's kind of hard to believe the way they fight, because... As you watch, you start to think, okay, would that have happened in real life? Would you be able to deflect five different enemies with one blow? And you'll start to think, maybe not. Sun Quan of the Southlands is another rival warlord of both Liu Bei and Chao Chao. However, 
he has the largest army, the largest healthy army at the point in time of the battle. And so that's why Lu Bei sends his uh, Kong being his emissary, his messenger to go to uh, Sun Quan and say, hey, can we be friends? Sun Quan throughout the film was known as a young leader. He just recently became warlord of the province. And although he is confident, he also really doesn't have any accomplishments. So at the beginning of the film, a lot of the other Chinese leaders are uh, just speculate that he's not going to be able to do anything or amount to much because he's ambitious, but he doesn't have the experience that he needs to back up his ambition. Will this battle be the start of his, his uh, confidence? Sun Xiang, uh, Shang Xiang is the sister to Sun Quan, and in the film, she actually does a lot of things to help the war effort. She's actually kind of really awesome. Um, she is able to retrieve and send messenger pigeons or messenger doves, be, doves between Sun Quan and uh, Kong Wing, while she also infiltrates the camp of Chow Chow. She effectively wanders through the camp for days, if not weeks, and maps out every single small detail on a cloth that she keeps wrapped up in her uh, clothing. So when no one inspects her or uh, thinks that she's sus, she's able to map all the stuff out and then re uh, quickly move back to Sun Quan and gave them an entire map of the entire the enemy's exact position, which they use in their attack. Which is that's an awesome piece of intelligence. She also leads a small skirmish or a small trap to try to um, bait some of the cavalry units of Chow Chow into running into a tortoise formation that that they then all die in. Zhao Yu is Sun Quan's top general. He is known as a cultured, respectable man. He's also very principled. Some uh, Kong Ling thinks his formations are a little bit outdated, but he says. Why are they outdated if they still work? Um, he is going to be responsible for help coming up with a plan along with Kong Ming that they would eventually use to burn the fleet of Chow Chow that they can then use to overcome him on the ground. And it will lead to great military victory. He is a great military commander. You will like this guy. And al along with the other forces of Liu Bei and also of Sun Quan. Chow Chow, or Xiao Chow, is the wife of Zhu Yi. In the movie, Chow Chow like, fell in love with her from a very young age, and they actually used to have a thing. Not a relationship, but they used to have like a crush on each other. However, Chow Chow started going a dark direction, and so um, Chow Xiao decided to... Or sorry, Xiao Chow started, uh, decided to uh, marry Zhao Yu of uh, the Sun Quan army instead. So um, in the movie, you're going to see that uh, Chao Chao's brother is going to question the moment and say, did my brother start this war for a woman? Xiao is actually going to use tea to poison Chao Chao, distract him at the right time, so then that way when Xiao Yun and Kong Ming's forces attack, they're going to do it at the right moment while Chao Chao is distracted, delaying his important decision making that he needs to make for a very long time. Gan Xing is Xiao Yun's assistant general. He is in a pivotal in moraling or sorry marshalling the forces and also providing good morale he is always serious you will never see him really smile that deeply in the film um but he is important because in the actual battle he actually gives his life after being shot with several arrows he picks up some fire bombs and runs up to the barricade or the stockade guarding the camp and basically commits suicide by exploding himself in such a large fire that it actually destroys the barricades and allows the forces of Zhao Yun to actually be able to get into the camp. If you have any questions over this, or if you're having a hard time putting on the characters in the different spots, feel free to hit me up. I hope you know you're appreciated, and I look forward to seeing you in class.